<clears throat> Stir up, the Lord, the wills of thy faithful people, that they plenteously bring thee forth the good fruit of good works, may of thee be plenteously rewarded through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Holy, 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 though the darkness hide thee, though the sinful human eye thy glory may not see, only thou art holy, there is none beside thee, perfect in power, in love, in purity. Well, we are <clears throat> with Christopher Hibbert's Cavaliers and Roundheads, the English Civil War. 1642 to 1649. We have a book flap. On the field in Nottingham in the summer of 1642, Charles I watched his standard being raised in a high wind and driving rain. For six years thereafter, England was rent by civil war. Whole counties became desperate, in the words of a Suffolk gentleman. Families and friends were bitterly divided as men left home to fight for king or parliament. Castles and towns, which a year before had been scenes of happiness and plenty, were besieged and attacked. Houses were plundered, churches and cathedrals desecrated. Savage battles were fought, <clears throat> and it was once peaceful villages were overrun by hungry troops, so-called clubmen sieged arms to defend against one side or the other. Some 200,000 lives were lost, many from plague and strife-torn towns, and the king himself was beheaded on January 1649. A social as well as military history that vividly recreates these scenes of war. In England, 350 years ago, Cavaliers and Roundheads is enlivened by astute and revealing character sketches, not only of one of the leading participants, the sla slight, sad, obstinate king, his dashing, ruthless nephew, Prince Rupert, the towering and forceful and slovenly Oliver Cromwell, but also such half-forgotten characters as Sir Arthur Aston, the brutal, detested governor of Oxford, whose brains were beating, beaten out of his skull with his wooden leg, the fat French wife of Earl of Derby, bravely defying her husband's enemies as cannonballs, thudded into the walls of Latham House. Abigail Pennington, the Lord Mayoress, marching out with the other city ladies, and continued on the back flap. Sometimes they don't include the back flap. More often than not, they do not. Cavaliers and Roundheads. By the same author, Imagine Court looks interesting. History. A lot of history books. A wide range on personalities and history. The English Civil War. York, Singapore, and Sydney. 1993. <clears throat> Contents. The Gathering Storm. Taking sides, <coughs> trial of strength, the spread of the war, London and Oxford, <coughs> fighting in the West Country, Bristol and Gloucester, Colonel Cromwell's men, part two, swings of fortune, roads to Marston Moor, fighting like beasts, the new model army, Leicester and Nasby, death throes. Oxford abandoned, soldiers and levelers, the second civil war, the death of the king, epilogue, the fate of characters whose end is not recorded in the text, 
principal civil war sites, buildings, memorials, and museums in England, bibliography, and then maps of campaigns, civil war locations, Battle of Edge Hill, Battle of Marston Moor, Battle of Nasby, the Preston Campaign. Table of contents, very detailed. Too detailed to read here. And it's got a picture of England, but it's upside down. There's a lot of battle sites. I'm looking. Oops, I made a mistake there. Hit the wrong button. Sorry, folks. <clears throat> oh, something's goofy going on here. Sorry. Okay, we did that. We. Okay, and we read the table of contents. We're on a map. I mean, table of principal events. I mean, down to the days and months, maybe 15 articles under each year, taking it down to 1658 with the death of Oliver Cromwell. I think it's where I hit a map. A lot of battle sites. Up north to the west. Um, okay, we'll just press on. And then it's got battle sites in the southern area. Lots and lots of them. Anything over at Exeter? Uh, I'm looking for my hometown of Exeter. There's Churton, Weymouth, Langport. They fought at Rat Rochester, Gravesend near London, Guilford, Basing House. These, I guess, it's battlefield sites rather than <clears throat> there's Exeter. Yeah, they had a battle there. Huh. Hard to read the map upside down. A, pic a picture of Cromwell looks like there's a wart over his right eye. That's distinguishable. Younger picture. Acknowledgements. This is a narrative concentrating. This is a narrative of the history of the Civil War, concentrating upon what happened rather than upon what it brought about, upon the minor engagements and sieges in which most of the war's casualties were incurred, rather than upon the major battles and upon the impact which the fighting had upon the civil population. I have at the same time introduced as much little known, curious, and illuminating dating detail as I've been able to find. It is intended for the general reader, not the student, although I hope the student to whom the field is new may perhaps find it a useful <clears throat> introduction to the works of scholars and the bibliography. And then it lists a lot of the scholars' names that and libraries and archivists. God bless the librarians and the archivists, different places, records here, there or else. Christopher Hibbert, I'm not sure what his background is. Prologue, it is called a superstition nowadays for any man to come with more reverence into a church than a tinker and a dog into an alehouse. Archbishop Laud. On Winter's Day, and that's how can he say that? That's an awfully supreme judgment. We find that a lot in among churchmen. Maybe it's an occupational hazard. 
On a winter's day in 1624, Lord Kensington, England's wooing ambassador, as he called himself, rode into Paris to present an alluring portrait as he could of the 23-year-old Prince of Wales. Without recourse to her hyperbole, which envoys in such a commission as his had commonly to employ, Kent, Kensington himself, extremely handsome man, of a lovely and winning presence, was confident he could draw a picture sufficiently appealing to recommend the prince as husband for the king of France's daughter, Henrietta Maria. Why in the world would the king of England, King James I, marry his son to a Frenchman where the hatred for Protestants was so high? <clears throat> that in itself deserves attention. He could honestly describe a courteous young man, kind and considerate, rather than delicate, even feminine in appearance, it was true, and by no means tall, no more than five foot four inches, in fact, but healthy, with limbs made strong by vigorous exercise, by riding, tennis, golf, a curious Scottish game, a Kensington had to explain, which required both skill and strength in wielding a crooked club to drive balls, made of hard leather, stuffed with feathers into certain holes. The prince was meditative and studious. He often read from a little book written out by hand and containing, though Lord Kensington had never looked closely inside it, noble sentiments and spiritual advice. He was the most regular <clears throat> in his religious observances. Yet he was a young man of action too and in, in for the absent action too and in for the absent Protestant bridegroom to whom he was distantly related. That's a poor sentence. The next month at Canterbury her second wedding took place. Who's he talking about? Her father-in-law had died some weeks before on 27 March so her husband was now King Charles. She was the Queen of England. What do we miss? Yet he was a young match, too. Yeah, this must have skipped a page. <clears throat> the people of London were re ready, ready to welcome her as such. So it looks like they get married. Canterbury. The people of London were ready to welcome her as such two days after her wedding. Yeah, I'm, I'm not so sure about that. Two days after her wedding, she and her husband set out on a barge from Gravesend, followed by hundreds of boats whose number grew ever greater as they approached the roaring cannon of the tower. The king and queen, both dressed in green, stood by the open windows of the barge, bowing and waving to the cheering crowds. All the way from the tower of, to Somerset House in the Strand, which was to be the new queen's London's home, the cheering and shouting continued as the crowds of people jostled each other on the riverside stairs, peered down from the windows, of the buildings on London Bridge on the Royal Barge clung to the sides of the surrounding boats. Yeah. <clears throat> the people's enthusiasm for their young <clears throat> Queen Henrietta Maria did not, however, last long. It was soon noticed that she responded to their acclamations, if at all, with a sulky ill grace. When they crowded around her and stared at her, she turned away and even scowled at them. Particularly, she disliked being watched with gaping curiosity 
and she had her meals at Whitehall Palace. Divers of us being at Whitehall to see her being at dinner reported one of the sightseers traditionally admitted to this intriguing spectacle and the room somewhat overheated with fire and company. She drove us all out of the chamber. I suppose none but a queen could have cast such a scowl. She took no trouble to learn English. She showed no inclination to talk to anyone except the French women who constantly surrounded her. She even refused to attend her husband's coronation, choosing instead to peer down on the king from a window in the old palace yard as under a dark and threatening sky, wearing white, not purple, the robes <clears throat> of innocence rather than majesty. He walked toward the abbey, accompanied by a dear friend, the Duke of Buckingham. It was only too clear that the Queen disliked England and the English people, that in particular <clears throat> she disliked the Duke of Buckingham, who patronizingly treated her as though she were a little inexperienced girl in need of his worldly advice, that she shrank from a husband whom she could not yet begin to understand or even to like. Unhappy and homesick, she took a perverse pleasure in being so obviously a former, in flaunting her Catholicism in the face of Protestant susceptibility. Well, you happy, James? You got what you wanted? Her husband's reaction to her pert, combative, and sometimes almost hysterical self-will was a cold, disapproving silence, occasionally bro bro broken by sudden flashes of rage. He complained to Buckingham of all her various neglects, the way she tried to avoid being alone with him how he had to communicate with her through a servant. Convinced that the cause of the unhappiness of his marriage was the maliciousness of her French attendants, a king who had conceived an aversion to foreigners, which was never entirely to believe him, determined to be rid of them. And on the afternoon of 26, 1626, accompanied by the Duke of Buckingham, he walked into the Queen's room at Whitehall Palace. Her attendants watched <clears throat> in a wed silence as he sharply told her to come outside with him for a moment. The Queen replied that if he had anything to say to her, he could say so where they were. Angrily, he took her hold of her hand, pulled her after him to his own apartments, pushed her inside, locked the door, and told her that he'd had quite enough of her French friends. All of them were to be sent home. She burst into tears, then fell to her knees in supplication, then losing her temper, ran to the window, smashed her fist through the glass, and began to shout to the people, gathered in the cart courtyard below. The king pulled her back, bruising her hands and tearing her dress. The king's unhappy marriage was but the most personal of the depressing problems that faced him on every side. The country had drifted into war with Spain, which dragged on for four years. And before it was over, <clears throat> England was at war also with France. Then in the summer of 1626, the Duke of Buckingham as Lord High Admiral led a disastrous expedition to relieve Huguenot rebels in La Rochelle, who were being besieged there by Catholic forces of the French king. You happy, Jim the one? Jimmy one? That what you wanted? A French princess for your son. And now you're at war. They're fighting the Huguenots. The Duke brought uh, his badly mauled army back to Plymouth with no little dishonor to our nation. Distressed as he was by foreign affairs, the king was as deeply troubled by affairs at home. But yeah, she's flaunting her Romanism in the face of a reformed Church of England. 
His father had never disguised his impatience with Parliament, or rather with the country gentry, professional men and merchants who constituted the House of Commons. After dissolving one Parliament, particularly difficult assembly, the so-called Adult Department of 1614, King James had declared that he was surprised that his ancestors should have permitted such an institution to come into existence. He could not govern indefinitely without Parliament, since he needed the money that only Parliament could provide. But he had always been insistent that the Commons had no right to question his policies, to interfere with his inherited prerogative powers. These privileges depended upon him, he had told the Speaker, <clears throat> denying that the Commons had any business meddling with matters of state. Well, you see where that's going to go. And when they had entered in their journal of protestation that their privileges did not depend upon the king, but were the ancient and undoubted birthright of the subjects of England, he had dissolved Parliament. I don't see how a king can do that. I don't understand that torn the protestation from the book with his own hand and ordered the arrest of those members whom he took to be troublemakers. Yet persistently, as King James had maintained, that his powers were absolute, laboriously, as he'd set them out in treatises on the divine right of kings, regularly as he had informed Parliament that he was outside or above the law, he was shrewd enough to never to lay claims to authority which the laws of the country or the Church of England would have good cause to deny him. Although he had frequently declared his belief that he had no duty to communicate with Parliament at all unless he wished to do so. In practice, he'd been in almost constant communication with it whenever it was sitting <clears throat> His relations with the commons, while often strained, had never reached a breaking point. Indeed, with the last of his parliaments, they had been perfectly agreeable. His son had been brought up in the belief, as propounded in a little manual, Basilicon Doron, which King James had written for him, that kings, like fathers, derive their authority from God, <clears throat> and from him also derive their right to demand obedience and honor. A few months from his accession, Charles had heard his father tell Parliament, and he himself clung resolutely to the belief throughout his life that the King of England sat on Jesus' throne on this part of earth. Charles was neither so shrewd as his father nor so wary. He did not appreciate just how possessively Parliament regarded its right to approve taxation. He affronted Parliament by virtually ignoring it, whereas it had been his father's practice to make long speeches to both houses, to send them free messages to remind them constantly of his theory of kingship. He himself addressed them in the briefest, curtest way. He left them in doubt that he regarded it as Parliament's duty, as it was all his subject's duty, to recognize his absolute authority, to trust him to do what was best for them and his own goodwill. Miserable in his marriage to an unhappy and highly excitable wife, dependent upon the wayward advice of the volatile and forceful Duke of Buckingham, he seemed driven by a nervous insecurity and sense of personal inadequacy to arrogate to himself privileges and rights which his father would never have claimed. This king, wrote Lucy Hutchinson, daughter of the lieutenant of the tower and wife of a Nottinghamshire gentleman, this king was a most excellent judge and great lover of paintings, carvings, gravings, and many other ingenuities, but a worse 
encroacher upon the civil and spiritual liberties of his people by far than his father. Grave, reserved, and fastidious as he was in usual demeanor, those close to Charles learned to beware of the sudden outbursts of anger, which erupted when he felt his authority or dignity questioned, to dread the obstinacy which was to bring about his downfall. Moreover, he was wholly lacking in the bonhomie which had attracted men to his great-great-grandmother's brother, Henry VIII, and where his father had often carried to such excess. For all his gentleness and constancy, the exquisite courtesy of his manner, his innate goodness, he was a man more revered and respected than liked. His constraint and lack of humor were barriers to intimacy that all but a very few found it impossible to cross. His slight stammer, in which another man might have found appealing, was in him merely a de defect, which made it more difficult for him to put strangers and members of Parliament at ease, seeming to emphasize the atmosphere of melancholy that surrounded him. This atmosphere was reflected in the normally sad expression of his face, an expression so well conveyed in Van Dyke's Charles I in three positions that when Bernini, Bernini saw it, that he described the countenance depicted as doom. Never, the sculptor said, never have I beheld features more unfortunate. Underlying the melancholy, there was a certain lack of sympathy in the king's responses, a defensive rejection of an intimacy that might reveal him as less assured than he tried to be. Few men ever felt that Charles really liked them. Few servants ever felt that their services were truly appreciated. If they did not do their duty, they were politely dismissed. If they did do their duty, they were merely doing what was expected of them. They were treated well, but rarely with a hint of warmth or affection. Our time has expired. <clears throat> verse three of or verse four of him three sixty two. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, <clears throat> all thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, the world without end. Amen. Godspeed.